Hello and welcome back to the Self-Actualization in the Age of Crisis Chapter Summary Series. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and today we're going to be discussing Chapter 3, Systemic Actualization, Subsection, Housing. So housing as a human right, as an eight dignity, is really contentious in a world where the, the dogma surrounding property ownership and its equation of freedom is held in the same reverence as any god that's ever been worshipped. Through the lens of our core values of equity and relation, every individual deserves right and, and access to a stable environment to live in uh, because without it, they're trapped in an inevitable cycle of insecurity. I also want to emphasize housing as an aid dignity is not an attempt to, to abolish all forms of residential private property. That's not what, what this is about. It is a recognition that the core that the idea and philosophy of property as a cornerstone of a free society has evolved into the very thing it was designed to resist which is the capture of of the majority of property by an extreme few essentially putting the many in in an indentured serfdom now the dogma surrounding housing as a public good are primarily come in the form of kind of some conflicting narratives, primarily that housing should be an investment vehicle, right? That's been huge in the United States specifically. And, and I am talking U.S. There's plenty of places I I around the world that have a much more enlightened approach to housing as a public good. Um, and I, I detail them in the text. You can kind of check that out for more examples. Um, but essentially, I want to emphasize housing cannot be affordable and an investment vehicle. Right at the same time, it can be one or the other. Um, affordable housing requires the kind of strict management and facilitation of, of housing in relation to, to human need. Um, as an investment vehicle, it, it must have a, a low supply, right? And and many of our struggles with housing are actually at the municipal level. So they're they're within your local communities with zoning laws and the kind of culture around individuals in those communities. Now, again, I want to emphasize many homeowners now are in the Gen X kind of boomer generation where they were sold the narrative their entire life that housing was their primary equity investment vehicle, right? So um, they have a very vested interest in, in exclusionary tactics to protect their own well-being. So this kind of identifies our core conflict. We want to elevate the collective human condition, um, but through our crisis of information, truth, and trust, we've been programmed to support uh, and, and really uh, ignore our responsibility to the other um, in favor of our own personal wealth generation. Today, the average American spends about 30% of their income on rent with the bottom, like the lowest components of our economic hierarchy, the people on the bottom, spend more than 50%. Uh, I also want to emphasize, and I do so in great detail in the book, um, housing is one of the most uh, obvious and, and consistent forms of structural racism in the United States and has been used uh, to be weaponized against uh, people of color for centuries. Um, so I really want to emphasize that um, housing has been a, a source of disadvantage uh, for the majority. So when we think about a housing down, kind of opening housing as a global public work, um, we can do that in many ways. But first, we kind of confront that it's really a contest between empathy and economics, right? As self-actualizers, we embrace the single truth in the relational universe. And because of that, we bear a great responsibility for the well-being of the other because they are one, right? We are one in this totality of an individual moment. The housing DAO then serves as a, a source of permanent public dwellings. So essentially, it'd be very similar to what we discussed um, in the, a previous chapter about property. But you, housing becomes this kind of contractual, time-limited thing where individuals can have a house. They can enter one of these public domains for a set period of time and they can choose. It could be their entire life. Um, it could be for a set period of time. They're, they're really maintained and, and supported by smart contracts that kind of you know, delegate and um, access an agency over time while also you're restricting it when the contract is up. Um, when they are done, they leave the residence. Um, if they die in that residence, there is no hereditary transfer of property. It is collectively owned, so it goes back into the community. Um, and the objective is to, you know, we could you know, start with prioritizing people who don't own homes at first, and we might kind of build on top of that. Um, the possibilities are really endless, but ultimately it would focus on acquiring and building um, new buildings, right? Um, uh, affordable housing for people and maintain them, you know, in, in upkeep. By removing the landlord, we take all that excess capital that's funneled into rents and funnel it back into building maintenance and security. It's like a co-op. 
essentially. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward idea that exists in a wide variety of formats. What we want to do is organize it as a global public work so you can have a bunch of decentralized communities. Um, that's also one of the benefits of the housing DAO is participants, not only do they get a home, but in many ways they're getting a community because if they're, they're embracing the housing DAO, they likely embrace the values of pluralism and collectivism that the self-actualizer embodies in their spiritual journey. Ultimately, having housing as one of the eight dignities frees the individual, frees their imagination and a, a long, you know, detailed history of moments within their time experience to stop worrying about stability, stop worrying about security, to, to kind of give them that from the start so that they can better direct the flow of their time experience and express their divinity in the moment.